The Bronze Bow, Chapter 17. This time, the villager said, as Daniel halted the blows of his hammer, Rosh has gone too far. How do you know it was Rosh? Daniel inquired, keeping his eyes on the axe he was mending. Is there any other man in Galilee who would dare such a thing? Five of the wealthiest houses in the city robbed last night. But how would he find out? That's what I can't see. How would he know, off there in the mountains, that Matthias was giving a banquet? Or which men would have taken half their slaves to make a showing? None of the rest of us even knew the Tetrarch was coming. Then how can you think it was Rosh? I don't have to think. The legionaries found out. Rosh might have got away with it if he'd been satisfied with the loot from the houses. But no, he had to make a night of it. Daniel started. Was there more to the story that had not yet reached him? Hand on the bellows, he waited. They tried the house of the centurion himself. He might have known the centurion wouldn't leave his house unguarded. Most likely the cutthroats got careless when they found the other houses such easy picking. Two of them were captured. Both escaped convicts anyway, they say. One died as soon as they started to question him. But the other told before they finally made an end of him. Which, Daniel wondered sickly, which of the men he had lived with side by side in the cave? I say they deserve what they got. Nothing but a pack of thieves up there for all that fine talk we used to hear. Not for a moment could Daniel let such a statement pass in his shop. Rosh is no bandit, he said. When he robs, it's for a good purpose. So I've heard, rob the rich to feed the poor. I'll be glad to see the poor that gets one penny of what he took last night. There may be more important needs, said Daniel. Like filling his own stomach? We'll see if he's satisfied now. We'll see if he lets our crops alone. I'll believe you when we can trust our sheep in the mountain. Daniel started up the bellows and cut off the rest of the man's complaint. This was the third man since morning who had brought the news that had slithered out from the city like a swarm of snakes to every village around. Some men praised Rosh's daring, elated to see the rich men defrauded, but more like this man were indignant. At the first news, Daniel's spirits had soared. Then, on the heels of rejoicing, had come doubt. Now, at the end of the day, he felt dull and let down. This, then, had been the reason for Joel's enterprise, the wholesale looting of rich men's houses. Somehow, both boys had expected something more noble, more worthy of the cause. What did Joel think of it? Was it worth the hours lost from his study, the danger? No question what Joel thought. That night, the meeting in the watchtower was jubilant. Bit by bit, the boys from the city had garnered every crumb of news to relate to the village boys. Joel was a hero twice over. Not only had he furnished all the information that had made the raid possible, he had even returned this morning to the very doors of the robbed houses to listen to the full story from the unsuspecting kitchen slaves. I'm going to keep at it, he boasted. It will be a shame to give up such an opening. I've got a special order from the centurion's head steward. Two dozen fish every second and fourth day of the week. There's no telling what I may chance on. He was far too elated to notice Daniel's silence. Is Rosh in danger? One of the boys asked. The yellow rat who was caught? Yellow, another boy objected. Do you know what the Romans do to a man? How long do you think you could keep quiet? There was an uncomfortable pause. This was a doubt they all faced in the night, in their own secret thoughts. They did not often speak of it. Don't worry about Rosh, Daniel assured them. The Romans have a price on Rosh's head for years. It's another matter to lay a finger on him. Questions broke out again. What would Rosh do with the money? Would he buy arms with it? Would he divide it among the farms, maybe pay back some for the sheep he had killed? There were so many needs for money. Daniel sat silent while they debated passionately the greatest needs for the stolen goods. 
Leave that to Rosh, he broke in finally. It is for the cause. The argument ended. They were perfectly satisfied. Looking at the circle of intense, swarthy faces, at the flashing eyes, feeling the unquestioning loyalty that bound them all to Rosh, Daniel cursed his own heavy misgivings. Why could he not be satisfied with his own answer? Nor were the villagers satisfied. Every day in the shop, in the marketplace, at the door of the synagogue, one heard the name of Rosh, sometimes bitterly condemned, sometimes as hotly defended. At last, Rosh's name was on every lip, as he had once predicted. Some swore he was the defender of the Jews, but others pointed out that he had turned against Jews. But though they muttered, most men clung with blind faith to Rosh. They still looked to the mountain as the stronghold of freedom and hope. The relay of messages which had succeeded so well was now intensified. Joel threw himself into the role of fish peddler, and with experience, he grew more shrewd in inter interpreting the bits of gossip, the signs of activity that he picked up in the doorways and kitchens of the city. Because he could not often leave home in the evening, other members of the band brought the messages to Daniel's shop. At night, Yokton crept down the slopes like a jackal across the cucumber field to a watchtower and back to Rosh with the day's report. A mounting excitement filled the watchtower where boys met nearly every night in the week. Here at last was something to do. Now they could see the results of their work. For the results were never far behind. Rosh had acquired the last link with the city for which he had waited. The boys had given him a weapon he needed, and he struck far and wide with suddenness and cunning. Joel learned of a Galilean merchant who was expected to deliver seven cruises of oil to the centurion's house in the morning. Though the merchant set out from his vineyard before dawn, neither he nor his oil was ever seen again. A bridegroom, son of the wealthiest elder in the synagogue, left the city with a gala party of his friends, laden with gifts to give to his bride in Sephorius. The bride waited in vain. Next day, the whole party returned to their homes, clad only in their tunics, bereft of their handsome cloaks, their gifts, and almost of their senses. A holiday party returning late by torchlight from the games in the theater at Tiberius was routed, stripped, and badly beaten. For none of these victims did the boys feel the slightest pity. Any trader who sold his goods to the Romans did so at his own risk. Those who flaunted their wealth or patronized a Roman theater were fair prey. And every cruise of oil, every silver talent swelled the fund that would soon maintain the army of Israel. As Rosh grew bolder, caravans and travelers increased their protection. The mountain owl's laws also suffered loss. The two men fell in Roman hands, three were secretly buried after night attacks, and four more nursed wounds in the cave. Rosh needed more recruits. Thus it came about that the boys were admitted at last into Rosh's actual service, and came to see the action they had craved. Not the trained army that Daniel had dreamed of marching to confront Rosh, only a guerrilla force of 19 eager boys. They met at the watchtower coming one by one crawling on hands and knees through the tangled vines to wait on fire with impatience for a summons from Rosh. Throughout the village, there was a sudden rush of bandages. Boys limped with a swagger, leered smugly through purpled eyelids, and grinned through a swollen lip. To harass the Romans was their real delight. A pilfered bit of Roman equipment, a spur, a leather gauntlet, was a prize worth risking one's neck for. One city boy who had made off with a helmet, even while a legionary who had laid it aside stooped to take a drink at the well, was almost as great a hero as Joel himself. Much of all of this, Daniel watched with dismay. It was not for this sort of skirmishing that he had dreamed of raising a band. To him, many of the exploits they boasted seemed childish. It had been his plan to wait, to train, to grow strong, and then to strike. This activity was like fire lighted too soon. Would it burn itself out before the day had come? But even he was proud of the catapult. The two boys brought word of it one evening, rushing into the shop out of breath. 
Right on the road they've left it, one of them panted. Only two guards. It's one of the biggest engines they've used in the siege of Sephorius. A wheel crumpled, and they'd had to leave it there till morning. I'll tell Rosh, said Daniel, laying down his hammer. Wait, let's take care of this ourselves, the other boy suggested. What could Rosh do with a catapult? Come on, Daniel, we discovered this. Why can't we have some of the fun ourselves? We can stuff it with oiled rags and set fire to it. What a bonfire that would make. Enough to be seen for miles, Daniel reminded him. No one used to burn good wood. We're in need of supplies, not bonfires. We'll take it apart then, they decided. Before he could make up his mind, they had taken the lead out of his hands. The word went out. Hurriedly, they scrambled together weapons, files from the shop, chisels and mallets. One at a time, by various routes, they made their way to a point overlooking the Via Marius and looked down at the monster that crouched there like an unearthly beast in the darkness. What do you suppose they're moving that thing for, someone whispered. I have a good idea, Daniel answered. It's the kind of thing Herod used against the caves at Arbella. You think they dare to attack Rosh? If he makes enough trouble for them, all the more reason, said the boy. We'll do away with it. Wait, cautioned Daniel. The guards are not to be killed. It would mean death to the village. I'll take one of them. Nathan, take the other, the way I've taught him. Before the guard knew what anyone was near, Daniel had one arm around his throat. When the man lay stunned and gagged, Daniel relieved him of spear and dagger. A moment later, a sharp whistle announced that the second guard was also overcome. One by one, shadowy figures crept from the rocks and surrounded the monster. They worked silently, muffling their cloaks with the rasp of file and the chipping of the chisel. Bit by bit, plank by plank, the monster shrank and crumpled. Over and over during the long night, the boys retraced the devious path to the watchtower staggering under the heavy planks and crossbeams. When the sun rose next morning, the catapult had disappeared without a trace. Nor did the Roman offers of reward or threats of reprisal produce a single hint of its whereabouts. The boys were wild with success. They swaggered through the village, taking little pains to hide their barked shins and blistered palms. Daniel tried to warn them. You will ruin everything, he urged. This is only the beginning. Why, they demanded, why can't we strike now? Look at the people. Would one of them give us away? They're just waiting. One word, and they'll be with us. Why doesn't Rosh give us the word? Joel sent warnings from the city. The Romans were strengthening their forces. A detachment of foot guard had come from Tiberias to join the garrison. The road patrol had been doubled. Even in the village, unfamiliar soldiers strolled, apparently without purpose their eyes alert under their helmets. Daniel insisted there would be no nightly activity for a time. The boys, chafing under the restraint, went scowling about the village. There was an explosive quality in the air. One morning, a shepherd hurried into town with word that three of the town flock had been snared and slaughtered. That morning, two men visited Daniel's shop. They say you can get a message to Rosh if you choose, one began. Daniel did not answer. If you can, tell him this. He is to leave our sheep alone. Do you begrudge a sheep now and then, asked Daniel quietly, to the man who would give his life for your freedom? We have had enough of his brand of freedom. He's free up there. Free from the taxes that bleed us dry. Free to play with the Romans while we stand and take the punishment. By the prophets, if you have any fondness for this Savior of yours, warn him now. We have had enough. Two days later, a farmer about to move with his family to man the watchtower in his field came upon his nearly ripened crop and found it plundered, trampled, wantonly ruined. Dismayed, Daniel climbed the mountain to take the warning to Rosh, only to have Rosh laugh in his face. They are afraid of their own shadows, Rosh jeered. What good are they but to raise food for men who will fight? They are desperate, Daniel urged. You know they cannot carry arms themselves. They're going to appeal to the centurion for protection. They want him to send legionaries. Let them come, Rosh boasted. Let them get a taste of the mountain. They will only break their teeth on it. 
Daniel went back to the village, sick at heart. We must hurry, he thought with despair. The whole village is turning against him. If the day does not come soon, they will never follow him.